Now this graphic from Johns Hopkins University shows the number of cases all over the world in this coronavirus outbreak. It stands at 118,000 with a death toll past 4,000. Countries like Lebanon, Morocco and the Democratic Republic of Congo have their first cases. Others have been announcing border closures and travel bans. We'll have updates from all around the world, from Asia to Europe to Africa to North America. We're going to start, though, in Italy because it's ending its first day under a national quarantine. Its numbers in terms of cases, well, that's gone up through the 10,000 mark. Now the death toll is 631. These are some of the pictures that have come in through the day and you can see the impact of this quarantine has been felt immediately. Here are the roads next to the Colosseum in Rome, almost empty. People have been told to stay at home unless they absolutely have to leave. These are pictures from uh, close to the Vatican. You'll see some P uh, Peters in the background in a moment and this area would normally be teeming with tourists. Not today, remember public gatherings have been banned. Further north, well, this is the situation in the centre of Milan, another place which would normally be busy, now almost deserted. The metro and the roads in Milan have also been quiet. And to be honest, I could show you any number of examples. One more is here in the main piazza in Bologna. And we're going to go there first here on Outside Source to Bologna because the BBC's Bethany Bell is there. People are moving around in the town of Bologna today, which they are allowed to do under this decree if they keep a safe distance for each other, although the government is urging people to stay at home as much as possible. Uh, in other towns close to here, which have been more impacted by the outbreak of the coronavirus, the streets are much more deserted. I was speaking to a woman in the town of Piacenza, which has had a spike in the number of cases. She says there, the streets are deserted and all you hear is the sound of ambulance siren after ambulance siren. And people here in Bologna are telling me, you know, they're very worried about what the impact of this will be on their businesses, whether they'll be able to keep paying their employees. And others say, maybe we did this all far too late. Others saying, possibly this is a bit of an overreaction, but a strange, strange time for people here. Well, from Bologna, let's move to Bergamo, a city at the heart of this outbreak, just to the northeast of Milan. The hospitals there are under severe pressure. Just listen to the experience of one surgeon. We are facing uh, which are, uh, what I call it a, a kind of wartime. Uh, I think uh, nobody can, could imagine this kind of uh, a crisis. We are uh, still observing a steep increase in the curve of the new cases uh, day by day. And now we are, uh, we are uh, beyond the 50% of our ICU beds uh, occupied with these patients. Uh, and uh, things are getting worse and worse for uh, physicians, nurses as well, because we are uh, as well in a, in a shortage of people because they are becoming infected uh, day by day and they have to stay at home in quarantine. Our hospitals are a hospital in, the, in a kind of war. Well, these new quarantine restrictions do not allow travel unless it's for urgent family, work or medical reasons. The trains and buses are still running, but if you use them, the advice is you have to keep your distance from others. All of that's designed to keep people safe, of course, but inevitably all of this is creating a great deal of anxiety too. Here's one woman in Bologna. I can't tell you how scared I am. I live alone, so I try to do what I can to keep myself healthy. I'm trying to avoid the virus, but how can I do that? We've also heard from Pope Francis, who's been detailing how priests will visit people to offer comfort. Let us pray to the Lord also for our priests. May they have the courage to go out and see the sick, bringing them the strength of the Word of God and the Eucharist, and accompany health workers and volunteers in the work they do. Well, one other important detail, there are of course huge financial pressures being exerted by on many Italians because of what's happening. And today, Italy's deputy finance minister said mortgage and tax payments will be suspended while the restrictions are in place. And while we've been covering Italy, one question keeps coming up. Why is this outbreak so much worse in Italy than anywhere else in Europe? Well, here's the BBC's health correspondent, Fergus Walsh. They had poor surveillance early on. The virus was circulating silently for weeks and they've been playing catch up ever since. Lots of transmission happens in the home between generations and that puts the elderly at risk and 
Italy has the second oldest population, proportion of elderly, in the world. Now we keep saying this is a mild illness for four out of five people, when, but when you have thousands of people infected and you can multiply the official figures by tenfold or more, then you get a massive impact from the minority. And it's really sobering to read the accounts of doctors in many hospitals where they say their critical care units are being overwhelmed with patients with pneumonia, breathing difficulties, they don't have enough ventilators, and they're setting up makeshift intensive care in corridors. Now, one question which comes up a lot at the moment is why is the rate of testing in the US for this virus so much lower in the US than it is in other countries? At the weekend, President Trump said this. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. The thing is, Vice President Pence had already said this. We don't have enough tests today uh, to meet uh, what we anticipate will be the demand going forward. Now here's the historian and columnist Max Boot tweeting, my son played basketball with a friend who had a high fever. Is he suffering from coronavirus? No one knows because almost no one can get tested. And he's written about his frustrations about this in the Washington Post. And this article details how South Korea, with a population of over 50 million, has conducted close to 200,000 tests. He then cites research that could only confirm close to 1,900 tests in the US, and that's out of a population of over 320 million. You could also look at this graphic from Business Insider. It compares eight countries. It says, for example, Italy has tested 826 people per million. In the US, it's five tests per million people. Now, that figure comes from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC as it's known, but it doesn't include all facilities. So, in theory, the testing rate could be higher, but we don't know. In fact, the government doesn't know. Here's the BBC's John Sopel highlighting an important point. John says that US has a health sector, not a health service, which is why you have the US health secretary saying, I can't give you a number of how many Americans have received a test because many receive a test through hospitals or public health labs. Now, that's true now, but it's only become true recently. A former US Food and Drug Administration official tweeted last month, since the CDC hasn't authorized public health or hospital labs to run the test, right now it's the only place that can do it, so screening has to be rationed. Now, let's be clear. American states have now been authorized. Millions of tests are being prepared. But that doesn't fix the original problem. Have a look at what this virologist from Columbia University had to say. I think we could have probably controlled this if we had effective testing. And many experts would argue there just hasn't been whatever the president says. And this is Donald Trump's challenge, a man who rose to power by often placing polemic, passion and identity above being truthful or accurate, is now faced with a virus which is oblivious to his attacks and distortions. I was mentioning John Sopel, our North America editor. This article from John is excellent. It argues this may be President Trump's greatest test yet. And we should add that while the White House says the president has not been tested for the virus, uh, that fits with the situation for the vast, vast majority of Americans. Well, we heard from the president a short time ago. We're prepared and we're doing a great job with it. And it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. We want to protect our shipping industry, our crews. Uh, industry, cruise ships. Well, speaking of cruise ships, one is docked in Oakland. This is the one that's been in the news the last week. It's called the Grand Princess. It's been kept off the coast of San Francisco for five days because 21 people on board had tested positive. Now it's docked. Most of the passengers who get taken off will be quarantined in military bases. Some will require immediate medical attention in hospitals. Let's speak to Chris Buckler, who's with us from Oakland. Um, Chris, help me get a handle on this. How many people are still on that boat? Yeah, so hundreds have now come off, but we understand that there's something in the region of between 1,500 and 2,000 still on board. Now, many of those who left were Canadians who have been returned to their country and also Americans many of them now have been taken to these military bases where they will have to spend 14 days in quarantine. Next, it is going to be the British passengers who are taken off and we understand that they are preparing to leave the cruise ship at this moment. The UK has now planned to arrange for them to head home. We understand they're going to leave here and they're going to fly local time around nine o'clock tonight and are expected to arrive back on Wednesday afternoon in the UK. And that whole process is beginning now. But you do get a sense just that this is taking a lot of time. There's some suggestions 
all disembark disembarking all 2,400 passengers won't take place by the end of today. It could well go into tomorrow, maybe even into tomorrow night. Beyond the passengers, of course, there is now real pressure on the companies who operate cruise ships. We've had two very, very high profile outbreaks of COVID-19 on board ships. And as a result, the American authorities are putting pressure on those businesses to ensure that they have got methods of addressing problems should they arise on board ships and try to ensure that the coronavirus doesn't spread. And Chris, just quickly, what's behind the boat that we can see behind you? What facilities have had to be set up on the dock? Yeah, you might just be able to see a little bit of it to the left of you of your screen on the boat, but there are tents that have been set up there. There are medical screening facilities that have been set up. And as people are coming off the ship, they are being screened. Now, that's not quite the same thing as being tested for the coronavirus, but they are being checked for their health, checking to see if they have got symptoms. But the sick passengers, they were the first to leave the ship. They've already been taken off and they've been taken to hospital. Ambulances were at one stage standing by there ready, but they are still checking passengers, such as the concern about this virus and it's spreading once these passengers leave here. Just a word on the British passengers, they aren't going to go into quarantine like the American passengers are. However, they're being told that they are required to isolate themselves for a period of two weeks. Basically, that means they go home and they stay away from people to try and stop the spread going into the community in the UK. Chris, thank you very much for the update. Now, more than 110 countries and territories now have confirmed cases of this virus. Let's bring you right up to date with a number of situations. First to Spain, there are now over 1,600 cases. That's 10 times more than a week ago, and 35 people have died. Various measures are being introduced. Schools in several regions are being shut. All La Liga games and Barcelona's Champions League game against Napoli will be played without fans attending. And a senior figure within the far-right Vox party has been diagnosed with the virus. That means Parliament has been suspended for at least a week. Now, also, do you remember that hotel in Tenerife, which belongs to Spain, in the Canary Islands, which was quarantined for two weeks? That lockdown is now over. Here's one of the British guests. Relieved that at last we're going to get to go home, but we cannot thank the people here enough. They have been absolutely fantastic. They've looked after us very, very well. Well, we move from Tenerife to Greece now because the government here has announced that all schools, universities, daycare centres and other educational establishments will close for a two-week period. Greece has 89 cases and no fatalities. Let's also update you what's happening elsewhere in Europe. This is the French culture minister. He's now one of over 1,400 cases in France. In Germany, where well, there are over 12, 1,200 cases, this hospital has set up a drive-through testing point to try and prevent patients infecting other people and you can see the test is done via the car window. Next to Austria where it's restricting people moving north from Italy they have to carry a medical certificate to cross the border and as you can see here they're conducting tests on the border for people who are seeking to come through. Well if that's the situation in Europe next we move to Iran where one of the most serious outbreaks is and a number of politicians there have now tested positive. You might remember this from a couple of weeks ago. This is the Deputy Health Minister wiping sweat off his brow during a press conference. The press conference was about the virus. Later on, he was diagnosed with it. Well, 30 Iranian officials now have this virus. At least 24 of them are in Parliament. That's about 10% of MPs. Two of those lawmakers have died. All of which is raising concerns that the spread of the virus in Iran may be worse than we're being told. And perhaps this contribution is muddying the waters still further. This is the former president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, saying the World Health Organization must immediately identify the lab that produced and spread the virus, as well as the other centers that supported the biological war against humanity. Just a reminder, if it's needed, that all scientists who have looked at this virus have concluded it shifted from wildlife to human beings. Well, here's Majid Afshar from BBC Persian on why there are so many concerns about the statistics coming out of Iran. This level of mistrust has also led to people not believing the numbers that the health ministry is putting out of the number who have contracted the disease and also of the number who have died of, of the disease. Some people are 
putting out reports or, or numbers of in thousands, while the government is saying it's um, still around 300, the number of who've, the number of people who have died of this disease. So you see how different reports and this mistrust between people and the government has led to a chaos in the country. Africa next. Burkina Faso in West Africa has confirmed its two cases. The Democratic Republic of Congo also has its first case. That means across Africa there are now 100 cases in 11 countries. So very low compared with Asia, Europe and North America. Now, of course, different countries are using different tactics. Look at these pictures from Rwanda, where you can see temporary sinks have been set up by bus stops in Kigali so passengers can wash their hands as they go about their business. Well, we move from Africa to Asia next, and first of all, to focus on the Maldives. Six foreign nationals there have tested positive, and two resorts have had to be locked down. In Singapore, we've been talking a lot about cruise ships, a ship called the Costa Fortuna has docked there. Passengers have started to disembark. The ship had been turned away from Thailand and Malaysia, despite none of its 2,000 passengers, who include 64 Italians, testing positive for the virus. No positive tests, but they were still turned away, but it's now settled in Singapore. Meanwhile, in China, where of course all this began, the news is better than it's been. For five days in a row now, the city of Wuhan, the center of the outbreak, has been the only place in China to record any new cases. And have a look at who's visited Wuhan. Here's Stephen McDonald. We could well be looking on this in the future as one of the key turning points in the coronavirus emergency, the day that Xi Jinping went to Wuhan. That's because this is a message to all of the people in China that the emergency is pretty much under control. Now, why would they think that? Because China's most important person has just travelled to the most dangerous city here in terms of the coronavirus and the potential of catching it, and images of him walking around the streets, talking to people, will give great encouragement. And I suppose another part of the message is that if, if President Xi can be at work in those circumstances, well, why wouldn't we also return to the job? I mean, at the moment, as you can probably see here, this is pretty quiet. It's going to be many weeks before anything like normal life resumes in most cities here. But this could be the start of that return to sort of normal work.